Hi, this is Pastor Jim, and I want to welcome you to a discussion on the Asbury Revival. If you remember, uh, a couple months ago, Joe Rice uh, interviewed me, and my good friend Joe is back with me today, so I want to thank him for taking his time and uh, Absolutely. Uh, just helping us talk a little bit about revival, and specifically the Asbury Revival. Kind of where do we go from here? So uh, we, we know it's now officially concluded a few weeks ago, but uh, we just want to begin or continue the discussion about what God is saying to us about revival. So I want to turn it over to Joe. This won't be just completely an interview. It'll be more of a discussion today, but I'm going to turn it over to Joe because I think he's going to lead us uh, in this discussion. So Joe? Thanks for having me back. Mm -hmm. I want to I start with a, a passage of scripture from Psalm 22. And uh, the, the passage I chose sounds like the speaker is um, describing maybe a call for revival. Now, Psalm 22 is familiar to most of us because this is the psalm that Jesus quoted from the cross. It's a psalm of lament. The speaker, I don't, it may have been David. This, this claims it to be David, I think it was probably David. Uh, the, the speaker is lamenting his life. He's crying out to God about his circumstances, but about halfway through, he changes to acknowledging that he's still going to glorify God in the, in the midst of the trouble. And I'm going to start at uh, verse 22. And it says, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but he has listened for their cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. Amen. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. And then down in 30 it says, Our children will serve Him. Future generations will hear about wonders of the Lord. So to me this sounds like the speaker is calling for revival, specifically this time in Israel, but a return sure. to something. And that's one of the things that we had discussed uh, previously when we had talked about this is that what does revival really mean? We had a little bit, I wouldn't call it, say that we disagreed, but we had different uh, interpretations of the of what a revival actually is. Should it be called revival so soon? Because they were calling the Asbury revival right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. And there was sure. a lot of pushback on that as to whether that was appropriate at that time. Should, what, should it be called revival at that point or or a worship service, or a moving of God, which it was those things, but revival is more specific. Can you describe, how, can you define revival? What, what do you think it, that involves? I, obviously, I think the, the key thing about revival is revival is for the church. So I would say that's the principal thing. So in other words, but I don't, I don't want to just... Uh, Trying to think of the right words to say here, Joe. Um, First off, any problem with my interpretation of, <laughs> of that? No, Did, no. I, that... I think that's certainly a heart for revival is what I see in that particular passage. Okay. okay? Uh, just to let you guys know that I have not studied this passage before Joe got here. Okay, so we're, we are really doing a discussion. All right. Um, but I, I think when we talk about revival, obviously it is a move of God. You can't. I think those terms are almost synonymous, but not completely synonymous. The revival is certainly for the church. It's not for outside of the church necessarily. It is to revive, if that makes sense, and not to make it too simplistic. 
but it's something that was there, then lost, and now it's being brought back or revived. Yes, a revival in, in effect is, is a returning to something that obviously, if we're, if we're returning to it, we're not there. Right. So we're returning to something, and when you see moves of God, whether it be Asbury or other moves of God in local churches or national type revivals at times, um, I, I think revival, the, the key for me with revival is it's for the church. It, it begins with the church. Now, the, the impact of revival is not only for the church, right. but revival itself is for the church. And I think that's what's, that's who was being revived, certainly at Asbury, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Okay. Now, you traveled there. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yes, I did. I believe you had several uh, clips yeah. from the services and mm -hmm. spoke in some shorter videos. Right. That, yeah. uh, that you got uh, quite a lot of attention for. We got a lot of attention. It wasn't all good. <laughs> it wasn't all good. It wasn't no. all good. No. You did say that you expected some criticism by uh, endorsing it. Uh, many of those criticisms came from people inside the faith. Now, we're going to assume that everybody that criticized the video, just for the sake of this discussion, is saved. <laughs> everybody had good intentions. It, there are inter different interpretations of, of, of Scripture, but everybody's in the family. Right. Um, that being said, did you expect the viciousness that you got from some of the criticisms? Or was it as vicious as... Uh, my son read me some of the uh, criticisms. He said, Dad, I'm not going to read them all to you <laughs> because when we, when we were getting a million views, it was just kind of fast. Right. Um, but just some, most of the criticisms weren't about Asbury. Most of the criticisms were just about even my presentation, which was under a minute, by the way. Right. And, uh, and it was very simplistic, I'll say it like that. It, it didn't really involve the revival, mostly me, sometimes just my language, if I use proper English. Uh, and to all the English teachers out there, I don't always use proper English. And, and so I was criticized for that and other different things like that. But I did hear some criticisms and I don't know if you're going to talk about them about the revival. A few uh, of them. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to leave that for Joe to lead into there. But there were some criticisms about the revival, but mostly from folks who uh, did not go there. Right. And they were just seeing what they observed. So, yeah, most of my criticism, yeah, they, you know, some people just I guess feel they need to criticize. So there you go. And that's that's part of the journey. Um, there were a lot of critiques about the, the um, revival that I actually found interesting. I watched a lot of videos on it and just to see what people were saying about it. And most of the, like you said, most of the strong criticisms were from people outside of the Asbury tradition. See, you and I are in that Asbury tradition loosely. Mm -hmm. so. Most of what was being brought up, we didn't think that much of. But from people outside of the Methodist or Wesleyan tradition that is the foundation of Asbury, right. uh, some of it might have might have seemed out, out of sorts or not, not at least not what they're used to. So I'm not going to go into a lot of denominational differences. That's... Those are always going to be there. They've always been there. Right. And until we get to heaven and realize uh, that a lot of that was put on ourselves, that it didn't matter as much as we thought it did. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll, we'll also figure out or we'll find out who was right about what. And then I'll be surprised that everybody's there together. But there are two criticisms that I want to focus on that okay. if, the, if they have truth, I could see myself getting on board with these criticisms. Okay. All right, so, fair enough, yeah. All right, so the first one that, that was brought up by a lot of people was the pilgrimage itself. The, some had criticized those who made the trip at all because they were trying to capture something and take it back was one quote, or okay. they wanted to be where the Lord was. And the, and the criticism for that was to say that, well, that can happen at your local church or anywhere that believers are. You don't have to go to a hot spot 
for to experience that. So you made the trip. Right. Is the is there a reason to go or is does this criticism have any merit uh, to say that uh is is there any benefit to going to something like that without instead of just trying to experience it where you are? Um I think if you're just going for lack of a better word, if you're just going for the show, um, and that's that's a terrible word, by the way, but I think people would understand what I'm trying to communicate. Right. Um, if you're just going for that, then I don't think that's good rationale for going. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I went because I felt I had experienced a revival when I was in Bible college. It was four days long. It was the same type of thing, not near as... Uh, big as Asbury, not near as it didn't get publicized. It was a little bit before social media. Yeah, right? yeah. So it just didn't have the legs that Asbury had, and Asbury had legs within 48 hours, pretty strong. Uh, that would never happen before, just with different culture. So, uh, so I had experienced four days, and I, I think what's important to realize about whether you know did I need to go? I didn't go there to find God. God's in my heart. God's right here. I'm excited about my journey with Jesus. Uh, But I had already had a a glimpse, already had a picture of what that was like. And so for me, I was going to say, hey, I just want to, you know, because I heard some of the criticisms too. And so I said, you know, I want to go, I want to go see, I'll know, I'll I'll sense it. I kind of know what this picture looks like. I know what it is to stay up all night. I know what it is to praise God. I know what it is, you know, to have that experience and some of that feeling. And it's awesome, guys. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. And so for me, uh, when I went, uh, we were there about three and a half hours. Uh, Longer than that, but it took us almost an hour to get in. Uh, But actually in the building, about three and a half hours. And after about the first five to ten minutes I didn't care about any of that I just sensed such a strong love in the room that was more dynamic than anything I've experienced in a long 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 time and so after that I just wanted to be a part of what God was doing in that moment so I no longer was in the Let's check it out. Let's authenticate it. Let's see if the criticism, I could tell almost immediately that this was something of God. This wasn't something fabricated. This wasn't something, there was no, wasn't star studded, if you please. And, and uh, so, so for me, you know, that's why I went. Uh, my son went with me. I don't think he felt the, exactly like I did, but I already had a picture. Um, Is there something to be said about a bunch of believers getting in one place? Does it, does it help manifest that? I don't think so in this case. I, th- I think a bunch of believers were in that place because it had already manifested. Okay. Not because a bunch of us got together, it manifested. I think it manifested and a bunch of us got together. Okay. Because there's something about it. it cause people have told me, Joe, they, they, they've said this. They said, look, I, I've been in great worship services. I've been in great revivals. I've heard great, you know, speakers. I've heard great singers. But that's not what this was about. And it's, it's very hard to describe. It's almost like if it's almost trying to describe salvation to a person who's not saved. They don't know how it changes you. You don't know how it feels. You know, it's not just intellectual, and it wasn't star-studded at all. The it was led by the college kids. Mm-hmm. Now, it, there was some stewardship with some older people that kind of kept it in order, mm-hmm. but it was not led by them. It was led by the college kids, and and so there was there was a lot of imperfections, if you might want to say it that. And to all you Asbury students, I'm not I'm not knocking you. I'm just I'm simply right. saying it wasn't set up like that. And, uh, but, and, and, and the reality, why, the reality was that I could tell almost immediately the love of God that was in that room. And it wasn't about who was singing and it wasn't about who was shouting and it wasn't about, 
even people coming to Christ because they did. And, and the testimonies I loved. But it was it was more about God than it was about the, almost the people, if, if you please. But he always works through people. So uh, what would you say to the criticisms that it was emotional and that's all, all that it was? Um, it was certainly emotional. Uh, but that's not unusual in a Christian right. service. You know what I'm saying? I, we've all probably had some experience of raising hands or, you know, some more than others. Some traditions are much quieter than others. But but it wasn't in any way out of control. It was, mm-hmm. it was very controlled. And I would say that, so, you know, I didn't em- emotion can be in any worship service, but to see to know that it was revival, I would I would say, what was the effect after the emotion wore off? Yeah, I I you know to me certainly I had emotions while I was in there, mm-hmm. uh, but the effect is still on me. It's another picture, it's another reminder, it's another confirmation of the power of God, mm-hmm. and what can really happen when. When it, even a group of, they say it started with about 20 students that just wanted to stay after chapel because they didn't feel like they were done. Right. And within hours, there's hundreds in there. And so, you know, I think that says a lot. You know, we, we wonder sometimes in our churches, you know, why, why don't we see things like that? Or why does it happen? Because we're too busy. Right. We got, we got, we got an agenda. We got too many things going on, and these guys said, "You know what? Yeah, I got class. Yeah, I probably got to go to work, but I don't think we're finished." And and I think there's some. I'm doing a little preaching here, Joe. So just, right. but I but I'm saying that's why you you have to come to this place in your walk with God where you say, "I know I got some other things that are important in life, but who's going to be most important?" I mean, and you're not going to have the experiences. If, if you're putting God on the time clock here and say, you got 30 minutes to work in my life, so you better hurry up. Yeah. That's, that's, not, that's not the way revival begins or works in the church. Uh, the, other, the other criticism that I could, that I actually made, made sense to me, if it were true, okay. was that there had been mixed reports on how much or how often the gospel was being presented. So... First of all, define the gospel, just real quick, just for anybody that doesn't know exactly what we mean when we say the gospel. The gospel would be the good news of Jesus Christ, that he has come to the earth, died for our sins, raised up again by the power of God, and we can have salvation through Christ. So in a nutshell, I would say that's the gospel. Okay. So was that presented at, at all? I'm, I would think that when you've got that many outsiders that you honestly don't know their backgrounds, I'm surprised they didn't do a presentation of it every couple of hours. Like I say, I was there for about three and a half hours in the building, okay? And they had it broke down hour to hour what they were going to do. So it wasn't a disorganized chaos of doing whatever you want to do. Right. And so if anybody had that picture, that's a false narrative, okay? okay? Uh, so from two to three, they did certain things. And now, one thing they did that I thought was real well, there was a presentation of the gospel. Now, it wasn't a preacher like me. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, I wasn't standing up and saying, okay, turn your Bibles to Matthew, and I'm going to tell you the gospel. So there, there was not that. But there, was, there were testimonies, and they took their testimony, because there was an hour where they had testimonies. And so they would have testimonies, and whatever that testimony was about, if that was about returning to the Lord, or God gave somebody a victory, or God helped somebody with this, and they would stand up to the mic and they would give their testimony. When the testimony was finished, they would then take that testimony, whatever it was about, and they offered it to the congregation. So let me give you an example, perfect example. So one of the testimonies was someone returned to the Lord. So then they had people stand up and say, if you need to return to the Lord. So they were preaching the gospel, okay? Not from a preacher, But they were preaching the gospel, and they said, you can return to the Lord. This is a safe place where you can return to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so if you feel like you've been like this gentleman who just testified, and you were, you know, 
out of the way and now you want to come back to the Lord. Or, and, they, and they gave invitation in a couple ways. Either you knew Christ and you wanted to return to Him or you've never known Him and you want to come to Him. They asked people to stand up. Okay, okay? and so those people had to make a public, you know, standing up, similar to an old Billy Graham, right. you know, revival service where they would stand up and walk to the front. And so they would stand up and when they stood up, then there was prayer for those folks. And then they would say after that, after that prayer, and I saw a couple that stood up and just began to weep before the Lord. So God was really working in people's lives uh, with salvation and or repentance and coming back to Him. Um, and so, and then they had altar counselors there. And so then they said, if you stood up and you're serious about your this uh, your your relationship to the Lord, we're going to ask you to come forward. And they did. They came forward. There was more than one. I mean, it was several people that would come forward. And they had prayer counselors there to pray for Which them. Which certainly would have discussed the gospel with you on a personal level. Absolutely. And that's what it was for. Okay. I want to move on to a passage from Mark. And this is specifically for the critics. I just want to speak to for a second. <laughs> um, this... This is a time when Jesus and the disciples were going around ministering, uh, performing miracles. And this was when Jesus was kind of dropping little hints as to his identity here and there. <laughs> and this is in Mark chapter 9. And it said... John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons, but we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group. Don't stop him, Jesus said. No one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. If anyone gives you even a cup of water, because you belong to the Messiah, I tell you the truth, that person will surely be rewarded. Hmm. So, we don't really know who this guy was that was casting out these demons that, the, that concerned the disciples, as far as I know. Uh, we do know that the disciples and Jesus had been in the area, so he was probably what we would call a new convert. He... Did he have all of his theology correct? Probably not. At this point, neither did the disciples. They had, they had a lot of stuff that they hadn't figured out yet, and this, and this stranger uh, probably didn't know everything that, that we have the uh, opportunity to know today. He, For in, sure. fa in fact, he couldn't have because the gospel story wasn't even done yet. This was right. before the cross. Mm -hmm. So all he knew that was... He was accepting what he knew about Jesus, and he was uh, use, he was in Jesus' name. Uh, this says casting out demons, but he was performing uh, uh, religious rituals in using Jesus' identity, and Jesus didn't condemn him for it. Right. He, he said, you know, he's not against us. He's on our side, even though he's not one of us. And I would just say to all of us on, on a different level, let's be gracious to people that are outside of our tradition. It's not, doctrine is important. Jude makes that clear. Right. But, um, you know, just because somebody doesn't come from your exact tradition doesn't mean they're outside of the family and you don't need to jump to that conclusion I, is my take on that. Anything you want to add to that? I think, Joe, you're doing great as a preacher right now. I think you're doing well. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree with Joe. I, uh, I, I think we're too quick in our day, probably. Social media is, is certainly a part of that. But I think we're a little too quick today just to jump and just to say anything we might not understand. Maybe we haven't experienced it. Um, I think we do jump like that. And I... And I think that's a real danger in the church. I think the church should be seen more as a community of believers 
than it is a denomination or a doctrine. And again, I'm with Joe. I'm, I'm a preacher myself. I think doctrine is very important. But, but I would say this, that we are, we are more a community of believers, a community of love, uh, than anything else. So, um, so I'm just, I'm just going to leave that there. If, I don't know what else you have, Joe, or because I did want to read another scripture, but I didn't know where you were leading us in the discussion from here. So, That's it with the revival part. Did you have something I, to... Can I share one more yes. scripture? Yes. Okay. Do All right. Hebrews chapter 9 says this, because this, this is what I was sensing in my heart while I was there. And I know there's a couple other flavors of this, but I, I, I want to sense this. When this began on that Wednesday, I believe it was February, I want to say 13th. I'm not positive. Eighth. Okay. Whatever the Wednesday was that it began, the Lord had spoke to me that morning. He said, go write a sermon. And my sermon was on a new view of holiness, a new way of looking at holiness. And I wrote it between the hours of 10 and 2. And, and while I was writing the sermon, that the Spirit of God just began to come over me. And he said, I'm loosing a sanctifying. Now, there's a word you might need to look up, but a sanctifying spirit. And it just kind of bubbled up in me, and I kept writing and, you know, and doing that. And by 2 o'clock, I had finished writing it down. It took me about four hours. And it wasn't just the power of the Spirit all the time, but it was just, it, it came like in waves. Just at certain times, it would really peak. It would really be heavy on my, just... I'm loosening a sanctifying spirit. And I had no idea what was going on at Asbury. And they say by about 2 o'clock that it was in full motion. And, and, and I learned that two days later when we began to cover the revival ourselves. And, and uh, so, so I wanted to read a passage out of Hebrews chapter 9. And not a whole passage. I'm just going to read one verse. It says, How much more with the blood of the Messiah who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. So if we wonder what a sanctifying spirit is, a sanctifying spirit is many things, and in this discussion I can't teach on it, okay? But I can say this, that a sanctifying spirit is, is a spirit that so purifies us, the Bible says here that we can be cleansed or purified even at the conscious level in our conscience. In other words, our hearts, not the physical heart, not the one that pumps, but in our spirit, man, the heart of our spirit, man, can be so cleansed that God can release a perfect love. He tells us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. And that was the type of love that was more demonstrative than any part of that service. It, like I say, not the singing, not even the testimonies, and I love the testimonies. The praise and worship was wonderful. Uh, the people coming to Christ was great, but just walking in, you could sense this type of love. And I think in the church community, we need that type of love in our hearts in order to go communicate this gospel that Joe talked about, this gospel to people who don't know about it. And it's that type of love that's so attractive, so powerful, so meaningful in the lives of of people it really authenticates our message and so i believe that that day on that wednesday there was a sanctifying spirit loosed in the earth and i think that sanctifying spirit is continuing to be loosed in the earth and i'm praying i know joe is that this revival as it goes to different places different forms different venues that it will continue with that type of dynamic love. Joe? All right. Real quick. Got my 15. Got my 15. I think we yes. just got our 15. <laughs> when The last time we spoke, your your main initiative was one more disciple. I think you still... you still that, That's the mission. Do, ...do that. Yes. In fact, I think it's on, it's on there, the wall there you go. behind us. Where did Got My 15 come from? Why not 10 or 20? Did, was this some kind of revelation? or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to over-spiritualize it. It didn't come from me. It came from my son, uh, James, who was preaching while I was in Alaska, uh, visiting my sister. Uh, and he preached that night, and that was going to be his application for a sermon. That, that How about we read the Bible 15 minutes a day for a week, get together with somebody, 
And uh, so you'd have a buddy for the week and you'd kind of keep each other accountable. Well, when I got back, we added the bookmark to it. We began to pray about it and see what that looked like. Well, now we're in 20 states. We're going to go to all 50 states. And after the, all the states, I'm going to go to all the cities. And we need men and women, boys and girls, reading the Bible 15 minutes a day. And this is why. It's not just so you can check something off on your to-do list for the day. The God, my 15, so you can begin to get revelation out of God's word for your life. And as more and more of us, more and more of us believers do that, I think there's going to be a higher and higher uh, energy for more moves of the spirit because God's going to be, God's going to be able to move more and more in people's lives. We're, we're going to, we're going to start seeing him in a different way. And so if you're listening to this, you don't know about Got My 15, all you got to do is go to activeadmission.org, our website, click the two bars on the top when you get there. It'll bring up Got My 15, hit that, and it'll take you to signing up. And when you do that, you start reading your Bible 15 minutes a day, and uh, you do it with somebody for a week. We'll send you out a bookmark and a letter, and we want you to be with us on a, a move for more revival. So that's where Got My 15 came from. That kind of leads into the last thing I was going to say to your audience. Okay. I was going to, I want to encourage you to find someone like this in your life that you can have these types of conversations with. Preferably somebody that's more schooled in the Bible than you, maybe, maybe a more mature Christian than you, but obviously everybody can't do that because one has to be below the other one. <laughs> but, but somebody that you can have these deep conversations about about theology and about about the Bible and about about Bible Bible accuracy, mm -hmm. and and what's what's the phrase iron iron, iron sharpens, sharpens iron, iron. Yep. and and uh, so, someone that you can learn from it your faith will grow. Amen. It, it's it's not it's not going to kill any faith. It, the more you learn, the more you want to learn, and the more it all comes together, and it just makes your faith that more that more strong. So, that much more strong. So. Okay. You want to pray? Why don't we just close with prayer and just pray for the audience tonight and everyone who listens to this. All right. All right. Let's pray together. Father, in Christ's name, thank you so much for this moment, these moments that we have together to share about what God is doing in the earth, what, about what God is doing in our lives. And Lord, that we just learn and we grow from each other in these types of discussions, and these types of formats. I want to thank you for my brother Joe that he's just willing to come on and share his faith in this way. And so, Lord, I pray blessing over him. And, uh, but also, God, I pray blessing over every person who's listening. And, Lord, I pray that as they listen, they'll even, they'll even uh, share this with other people so other people can listen as well. Lord, we, we are concerned about one more disciple. We meet many, many people every single week, but we care about one more disciple. And Lord, I pray that as a person listens, that their heart will be touched, that the Spirit of God will begin to move in them in a, in, a, in a new way, in a clear way, in a direction that maybe he's not moved before, but this is going to be a fresh new start for them. So God, I just praise you in advance. I thank you, God, that even though Asbury was an awesome environment, awesome experience, and I so thank you, God, for it, I believe that there are more revival moves that God wants to do, and he will do as his people obey him. And Father, I'm going to thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless.